So in other words, there is going to be mishap, death, all kinds of dysfunction. It will affect the universe, how we live our lives. That's how detrimental sin is. That's why God has to put penalties into place. If he doesn't put penalties, he cannot prevent chaos from happening. Believe it or not, penalties are a lot of times protective factors, safeguards. Not just God throws it at you because sin must be punished. We also have to realize that it's also a protective guard from a worse outcome that can occur, which is utter chaos. So sin has to be paid for. It must have a penalty. And Romans 6.23 demands that. If we're going to go to Matthew chapter 25, go to Matthew chapter 25, please. Okay, here, so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to erase this, draw a longer line here. Hell, when it was created, I know that lost sinners burn in hell, but believe it or not, for some of you, if you didn't realize it, God did not create hell for you. People might say, well, God sends sinners to hell because they've sinned. I think that's just very unfair. Uh, that's a rotten God. Why would he create hell for that? No, he never created hell for you. The intention of hell was for Satan. It was for Satan, not for us. Matthew chapter 25, verse one, uh, 41. 41. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. But that everlasting fire, hell, is what? Prepared for the devil and his angels. It's for them. It was never for us. Well, then, we do realize that because of Satan and his uh, wickedness and his minions, that's what hell was created for then why do we go there? Why should people burn in hell for all eternity? Why is God so mean on that? The reason why is because of what follows here. What follows here, let's go back to the basics. Hell is the punishment for Satan's sin, his rebellion against God. He tried to go against God. What do you think God's going to do? Just leave it alone because God is all loving? No, he has to put a stop to that. He has to put a protective factor. That's why he had hell as a protective factor to prevent Satan's chaos from breaking apart everything. But his act, his rebellion, is known as sin. So Satan, because he's not a gracious being, he's not a fair being, he's not a merciful being, and he doesn't want to go there alone, and he knows that God created you and I with the intention to love and have a good relationship, you think Satan's going to leave everything alone, or what do you think Satan's going to do? So Satan, he's not a stupid guy, okay? So what he's going to do is, ah, I know why I qualify for hell, it's because of my sin. So if I want to go against God, break his heart, the best thing to do is get these people to join me in this act of sin. And because of that, that's why they're going to go to the same hell as me. That's why we burn in hell forever. Hell was never intended for us, but we decided ourselves to join Satan's side in sinning against God, rebelling against him, living the way to what we think is our own way, but no, we've actually joined Satan, which is a life full of rebellion, life full of lust. Go to John 8, John chapter 8. Because we want to do however our flesh feels. We have our own lusts. Well, those lusts are based off of Satan, you have to realize. It's based off of Satan. So because we conjoined ourselves with Satan by conjoining with his lust, that's the reason why now we have to go to hell. John chapter 8 and verse 44. 
The Bible says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the what? Lust, Lust of your father ye will do. That's why he became our father. We joined his side. Now let's go to, go to Genesis 3 and Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 3, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 6. I've talked about the reasons, the reason for penalty. Now let's talk about the history of penalty. The history of penalty. When God laid out his penalized system against sin, we got to kind of go back to the past. So let's rewind here. Let's rewind. We know that Satan was the start of it. So we'll just put this as one. He was the start of it. That's where history goes. Now we go to number two with the history of the penalty. The obvious one is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. I won't read it for time's sake, but look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Mankind made the decision that, God, I want you to leave me alone, all right? So they want to rebel against God. So they decided to get away from God and to join, remember, Satan in his lust. Well, what's the consequence then if there is no penalized system or boundaries or rules that God set and then mankind is left to their own lust that creates sin? When sin is left to its own devices, what happens? Oh, everyone lives happily ever after? <laughs> that's, that's stupid. You know what happens? Chaos. Right. Disorder. It was a huge mess. So go to Genesis 6 and verse 56. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 through 6. Excuse me, verses 5 through 6. Notice that Genesis 3, 24, mankind, wanted, uh, mankind and God was separated. No boundaries made. And then Genesis 6, 5 through 6 shows that, verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great. That's why in verse 6, the Lord was grieved. So there was chaos everywhere. It was a huge mess. If you look at verse 13, earth was filled with violence. So I told you that your natural habit habitat is negatively affected. The place that you live in will be affected by your sin. If you honestly believe your sin will not affect the place that you live in, then uh, you don't understand. You don't know. That's what the world's trying to do, right? They try to pretend that there is no such thing as sin and that everything is relative nowadays. And because they do things like that, no wonder that your city is in a mess. It's in chaos. Now go to Deuteronomy 4, verse 40. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 40. Hence, because of the chaos from Noah's flood, you know the story, God drowned them out with the worldwide flood. And then he says, okay, then I'm going to give them rules. So the law of Moses was set into place and it can be, it has as many regulations as you can get. It is so detailed that it'll bore you as you read chapters and chapters of literally books, books uh, of the Bible laying out regulation after regulation. That way they can prosper, succeed in life, prevent chaos, disorder from happening. If you look at verse 40, thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. So again, notice right here, notice how people are able to succeed and prosper in life rather than falling into chaos, which is why God laid out all these rules and regulations. If you look at Exodus 31, go to Exodus 31. Okay, so God lays out his regulation. 
But a lot of people don't understand because sin can become very severe. The law will have to make up for it by being severe itself. It has to follow the severity, showing how detrimental sin is. It's not to show how mean God is or how legalistic God is. It's more so of showing how serious sin is, how hurtful sin can be. So God had to cover all bases. If you look at Exodus 31, <clears throat> verse 15, the penalty of the law was very severe. We see right here in verse 15, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall what? Surely be put to death. So God immediately killed you if you didn't observe the Sabbath in, during the times of the Old Testament. That's how severe the penalty was. If you look at another example, go to Leviticus 20. Leviticus chapter 20, and we'll look at verse 2. Leviticus chapter 20, and then we'll look at verse 2. Well, I don't see what's the big deal about observing <clears throat> the Sabbath in the Old Testament. To you, uh, the reason why it's not a big deal to you is because your mind and my mind are so finite. Right. In other words, that translates to you are really dumb. You are really stupid, sorry to say. Right. Why? Because God is an eternal mind. So he sees all possible situations, scenarios. Now, the simplistic way to say it, that way our stupid human minds can comprehend it, is to say that when sin is left to its devices, God doesn't put a penalized system, then it affects, negatively affects all of creation around us, correct? It's going to be chaos, disorder. It's going to be a worse outcome. So pre to prevent a worse outcome from happening, God has to put a worse penalty right there upon that individual before it affects everything around him or her. Did that make any sense right there? So the worst outcome should happen to the individualized uh, person before it can happen to everything surrounding that person. That's why the penalties are very severe. That's how serious sin is that people don't understand. Now, Leviticus 20, verse 2. <clears throat> Leviticus 20, verse 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. And the people of the land shall, not just death penalty, but stone him with stones. Stoning to death is very brutal. But the Lord did a brutal death penalty to show how brutal the act of sin was. Amen. But if it was left to its own devices, then the worst outcome that affected everybody is even more brutal itself which is a whole bunch of people sacrificing babies. <laughs> See that? So that's why the stoning to death is upon that individualized person. That way people can see and observe, wow, that's how brutal that act of sin is. But they themselves don't realize how brutal their sin is until they see a brutal penalty, right? Of how that sin turns out to be. I don't know if that made sense to any of you. But anyway, uh, the other verses you want to write down from the same chapter are verses 9 through 13. 9 through 13. Verse 27. Verse 27. And the last one is chapter 24, verse 16. Chapter 24 and verse 16. Now, the high standards of the law made people realize how wicked sin is, as I've told you before. The proof of the wickedness and the severity, the brutality of sin is revealed from the law itself. That was the job of the law. That was the job of the penalized system. It's high standards. That's Romans chapter 7 and verse 12 through 13. 
Romans chapter 7, verse 12 through 13. Uh, I'll read it to you quickly for time's sake. Uh, if you don't have time to turn there, that's, that's fine, but make sure you write it down. But the Apostle Paul wrote that the law was, in, was intended to show how wicked and how, that sin may be really sin. The Bible says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy <clears throat> and just and good. Was then that which is good made sin unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now go to Romans chapter 2, verse 23. Romans 2, verse 23. Now history shows that when God established the law, people still sinned against him, even though they lived religiously. In spite of how much that they lived religiously, basically they were hypocritical. They didn't keep the law. So the law was kept to protect people from sin, but it unintentionally turned into legalism. See that? It unintentionally turned into hypocrisy, a religious pride full thing. That's why, I mean, look, I'm, I preach against sin, and I preach against the liberals where they don't make sin a big deal, but the liberals do have a point to get upset at Christians for being holier-than-thou people, for being legalist, for finding scandals with Christians and publicizing them to everybody. They do have a point. Yeah. Why? The point is, is that what they're frustrated with is that here are people boasting and, bra and pushing legal standards on people, but they themselves break the law. They themselves are corrupt, or they think that they're prideful, that they're better than me. See, that's why the lost people, the liberals, hate you. That's what they accuse you for. Don't give them justification with their accusation. Amen. Let their accusation be false against you. Amen. So Romans chapter 2, verse 23, <clears throat> Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. Now go to Romans 3, 19. Romans 3.19. So Paul was uh, rebuking them for being boastful. Romans 3.19 through 22. So the Lord showed from history that, hey, okay, the law was intended to protect you, but you guys are so wicked that even if you kept the things of the law, there are things there that you break. There are inward things in the heart that you have issues. Pride and hypocrisy, etc. So then God says, then I will keep the law for you. And all you have to do is put faith in me. Receive my righteousness from the death of my son. So the law, instead of turning into legalism, the law should point out your need of a savior to fulfill the law for you to take away your sins. So now the law's uh, position has been switched. In the Old Testament, it, were, it was a protective factor uh, from sin for them. However, what happened is that they couldn't keep the law. So then the Lord had to keep the law for them through Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ said, I kept the law for you. So what I want you to now see is that the law's job is to show you that, you, that you're still a wicked sinner Amen. and that you can't keep the whole thing and that you need to humble yourself and put your faith in me yeah. to save your soul from hell. So now that's what happened with the penalty of sin. Jesus Christ took our penalty. Notice Romans 3, 19. The law's job is to make you guilty. Verse 20, it's to show you that you are a sinner and that you can't be justified by the law. You can't keep it. Verse 21, it's to show you that the law's job in verse 22 is to give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, the law's job is to show you I can't give you righteousness, so now I need to point you toward Jesus Christ where you need to rely on him for his righteousness. And that's why verse 23 
<coughs> Paul can say everyone's sin. No one can keep it. Now, penalty has uh, many variations. Go to Galatians 6. Galatians 6. Now, this one is going to be a good one. It's going to show you how the penalty of sin operates. Now, the first thing how the penalty of sin operates is Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Basically, everyone is going to uh, reap what they've sown. Everyone's going to reap what they've sown. So he will be fairly paid for the act, the sinful act that he committed. The following consequences are as follow with the variations of the penalty. The variations uh, will point out, let's see right here. I will go all the way up to here. No, it's just going to ruin everything. Forget that. Okay. You reap what you sow. Fair payment. Fair payment. Amen. Notice that the Bible reads, uh, Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. So whatever you sow... You're going to reap in return fairness. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now the second factor is Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. So you're done, right? Well, the, no, believe it or not. A lot of people don't realize how pervasive the negative effect of sin is. So the penalty has to be pervasive itself. The penalty of one sin could affect the next generations. That's another thing. So not just you paying for it, your next generations, your loved ones surrounding you can pay for your act of sin. Well, that ain't fair, you might say. But one must realize how seriously powerful sin is. For example, a teacher's incompetence in class is going to affect the student's knowledge of learning. That ain't fair, but that's what it is, even though it's the teacher's fault, not the student's fault. A parent's laziness will affect the family's entire income. Well, that ain't fair to the kids, but it's going to affect everybody because of the parent's laziness. Think about uh, the, gov uh, the government leader's misguidance. It's only going to affect him, right? No, it affects the whole country. That ain't fair. But that's how reality operates. Why? It's called sin. Get sin in your reality thinking caps. You all don't think about that. That's how detrimental sin is. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, see just one, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. So it ain't fair, but that's how it works. It affects everybody. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them, look at this, even over them that what? Had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. That's unfair. Yeah, you're right. But the unfairness applies to sin, not to God. All right, go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. <clears throat> Depending on how much a person sins, the burning up level of hell can vary. So a lot of people may not know this, but there are different burning severe levels in hell, and that depends how much sin that you have committed in your life. So if you're a lost person then there are different levels of hell depending on how wicked you lived. So go to Matthew 23, 14. The Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the what? Greater damnation. So notice right here that... Greater damnation. 
is applied to a religious leader who takes advantage of a poor widow here. Why? Because that's an atrocious, uh, grievous sin. That's worse than other normal sins that you would see likely nowadays. So God has greater levels of hell. Zechariah 8. Zechariah 8. Now here's another variation of God's penalty. There's a difference between what we call punishment and chastisement. Now, some people may not know that. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I'll say that God punishes a Christian. However, that's not, uh, if we're going to talk about actual biblical terms, that's not accurate. Now, I'm not going to get on anyone if they say God punishes Christians, because I say that quite often too, because we know what that means. However, in biblical terms, it's not accurate. Punishment is an angry God giving the sinner what he deserves for his sin. So we're now going to talk about the distinction with punishment and chastisement. So the second passage you want to turn to is uh, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Punishment is based off of God's anger. On a lost individual, giving the sinner what he deserves for his sin. This is toward a lost sinner. Notice Zechariah 8 and verse 14. And then we'll later go to uh, Hebrews 12. I'm in the wrong chapter, sorry. Let's get over there quickly. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you, when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. Notice right here, uh, we see wrath, and God punished their forefathers. And you do know that a lot of those Jews, they did die and go to hell on God's wrath. So he gives a sinner what he deserves for his sin. Now go to Hebrews 12. Notice that chastisement is a, get this now, a loving God. He might be angry, but even uh, parents who love their children, they can be upset. But there's love still there, which is why they... Uh, do the, they do the discipline or the penalty against you. Yeah, Chastisement is based off of love, and it's directing the Christian to the right path. So notice this is a, applicable not to a lost sinner, but to a saved believer, a saved Christian. So that's what chastisement is based off of. Uh, how many of us got chastised by the Lord? Amen? Right. Yeah because he's doing his job as a father who loves us. Hebrews 12, verse 6. <clears throat> For whom the Lord loveth, see that? He what? Chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now, the proof text that we see here is... God disciplining his children, but he calls it chastening, not punishment. But a better proof text is 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Now, notice, I like this verse. It definitely proves that God has a different type of penalty upon a saved believer compared to the lost world. As a matter of fact, the Bible even shows that God penalizes his saved children so that we don't share in the same penalty with the lost world. So a lot of times when God chastises you, it's to prevent you from falling into the same judgment as lost sinners. So we go to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 32. 32. But when we are judged, see that? So when you get judged by the Lord, we are what? 
Chasten of the Lord. See, why does God chasten you? That we should not, what? Be condemned with the world so that you don't share in the same judgment that the lost world does. All right. Now we're going to come to the types of penalty. Types of penalty. Now, this is going to be a lot, actually. So we're not going to have time to go through all the verses. So we're going to go through the lot. Types of penalty. All right, well, what can happen to me when I sin? What's the harm? You ready? You're going to write a lot. All right, we don't have time to go through the verses. You saved Christians think that you got a license to sin. You can do whatever you want. And there are these lost people. What's the point of, what's the problem with me sinning? What's the consequence that can happen? Plenty, but you just keep blinding yourself and you're not seeing it. All right, you ready? All right, types of penalty. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. First one, a sinning person will only enjoy. So this is the most positive penalty, okay? So this is the most positive penalty that you'll get. A sinning person will only enjoy the best of life temporarily. That's it. Enjoy. Yeah, enjoy your sin. If you really want it that bad, fine, but it's only temporary. That's the only, only positive thing that sin will ever bring to you. Doesn't sound much of a, a gift or a blessing, right? This one. It's a penalty more. All right, now we get worse. All right. Sinning person will reap what he sows. We kind of covered that, right? So, reaping what he sows. That's Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Galatians 6, 7 through 8, which we read. If your hand was already turned to Hebrews 11, 25, uh, I'll just briefly quote that last part. But the last part says, uh, then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, you'll notice that Moses preferred suffering there yeah. than enjoying sin. That's pretty serious then. That's very serious. So you know what that shows you? The worst, listen, the worst you... The worst you can ever experience living right is still preferable than the best you can ever than the best you can ever experience in living wrong. That's a good way to put it, Pastor. Amen. I don't want to live life as a Christian. It's just so bad, so bad. Well, you don't know what bad is, one. But if you were to really experience the worst later on and it does get worse for you, it's still better than enjoying sin. The best of sin. Because the best of sin is temporary. That's good, preacher. That penalty is so horrible against sin. A lot of people don't understand the weight of this. And then you have to read what you... And we're not done. That's just one. One. Then you got to read what you sow. So pay the piper, right? You got to pay the price. Every t year you wasted in sin. Every day you wasted in sin. Every hour okay. you wasted in sin. You're going to reap the repercussion of that. Hour by hour, day by day, and stuff like that. Sinning person will have no peace in life. That's Isaiah 57, verse 21. Isaiah 57, verse 21, which we don't have time to turn to. But that verse shows there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Fourth thing is the sinning person will have to take care of himself. He'll have to take care of himself. Now that sounds like a good word, self-care, but it ain't your, uh, your idea of self-care. In other words... Any problem you go through in life, you have to take care of it yourself. There's no help for you. You have to take care of it yourself. So if you do have a problem and you want to take it to the Lord in prayer, hey, that's going to be ignored if you lived in sin. You have to, reap, uh, you have to take care of it yourself. God's going to go, well, no, you always did well without me, you thought, when you lived in sin. So why don't you take care of those problems yourself since you think you can live well without me? So in Luke chapter 12, verse 29, it says, And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of doubtful mind. 
For all these things do the <clears throat> nations of the world seek after. That's the job of the world is to look at stock markets. The job of the world to always look at their uh, bank accounts. The job of the world to always worry, worry, worry. I have no solution for them. They're supposed to live that way. Why? Because they're living a life full of sin. And you want to follow the world? Then I have no answer for you. No answer for you on that. Unless you, the only answer is cast off the sin. That's it. Sinning person will be denied a prayer. You heard that just now. See, prayer is denied. That's 1 John 3.22. 1 John 3.22. The verse says that uh, whatsoever we ask, he will give. If we keep his commandments, do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So when you sin, your prayers are not being answered. Well, I pray, uh, I pray every day, Pastor. Great, but probably you just wasted your time. Why? You never got rid of your sin. Imagine that. All, your, all the things you wrote down in your prayer diary. Waste of time. This motivated you to get rid of your sin, right? See, sin ain't worth it to keep, friend. <laughs> sin ain't worth it to keep. <laughs> but it just gets worse, okay? A sinning person will lose joy. He loses the joy. So John chapter 15, verse 10 through 11. John chapter 15, verse 10 through 11. Well, I enjoyed sin... <clears throat> So then uh, why can't I uh, get that joy back? Because it's going to be loss. You have to suffer loss. That's how sin operates. Seven, a uh, sinning person will become, I don't like this one, frustrated with struggles. Frustrated with struggles. You know one thing you don't like about sin? is that you keep struggling with it. Yes. Especially if there's a sin you're hooked on to. Yes. Do you know how it is to live your life struggling against that? Trying to live clean, and then, but you can't help it. And yeah. Yeah. Why did that happen? That happened because originally you lived 24-7 in that sin. To get out of that habit is not easy. Sin's fun, huh? Romans chapter 7, verse 18 and 24. Romans chapter 7, verse 18 and 24. Hey, some of you are still got some old habits that uh, you're no longer doing, but you struggle with. Okay. That's right. It was worth it, wasn't it, living all those years in sin? Come on. It was really worth it, wasn't it, huh? It will be worth it all. When you went through all that uh, sinful stuff, was it really worth it? But with suffering... You can sing it will be worth it all. But not when you suffer sin. Yes. Wow. Think about that. All right, but uh, anyway, a sinning person will become restless with his conscience. Oh. Ah, I'm feeling connected just talking about this. All right, Romans 13, verse 5. That's based off of Romans 13, verse 5. I think I gave the previous verse, right? Frustrated? Yeah, Romans 7, 18, and 24. Okay. A sinning person, oh, gets worse. A sinning person, a lot of you don't know this, can become demon-possessed. Demon-possessed. You might say, really? Yeah. Even saved Christians can face demon possession. You might say, why is that? Because Satan, he cannot possess your spiritual nature, but he can possess your fleshly nature. Why? Because your flesh still sins. It's not perfect 100%, holy 100%. So it's filled with sin, so the devil can do whatever he wants to mess with your body. So if you've been suffering demonic attacks recently... While you're sleeping or your mind's running and these things just come out and you feel something. There's some sins that you're clinging on to and then it's just got a hold of you. All right. Uh, 
10, a sinning person will face health damage okay. or death. Okay. Health damage or death. Well, I got weak lungs, and that's the reason why my health ain't that good. What you been doing all those years? What you've been putting in your mouth all those years, huh? You know what I mean? I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to tell you. So that's the reason why your health, your health gets damaged, and people die early. That's First Corinthians chapter eleven. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse thirty through thirty-one. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse thirty through thirty-one. All right. So we do have some spare time. So let's look at at least a few of these verses. So let's go to First Corinthians eleven. And then, by the way, I, I, get act, I get criticisms from people watching me online about chewing on this thing, but know this, I have to take this, yeah. sorry, okay? All right, I know it's rude, and I, you shouldn't do it when you're publicly speaking, but I have to do it, all right? I need it for my throat. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to take it. By the way, if any of you preach or teach on this pulpit, don't do what I do, please. <laughs> I, but I have to do it because I need, so I'm still recovering, as you all know. So, All right, uh, look at verse 30. For this cause, due to their sin, many are what? Weak and sickly among you, and many what? Sleep. That means they are dead. For if we would judge ourselves, see, if you were to judge yourself beforehand, we should not be judged. Then you wouldn't be judged with sickness or death. All right, go to Psalm 31. Psalm 31, but it keeps getting worse. It doesn't get better. It keeps getting worse. A, a sinning person will face a tragic death. A sinning person will face a tragic death. You know, when you start to think seriously about sin, when you're dying on your deathbed. That's when it all hits you. And then you realize you wasted your life on a lot of dumb stuff. And then there are regrets. Then you, feel, then you start to make up for it. Or you go, man, if only I could switch back the time. And so you'll, you will not end your life well. Okay. Man, imagine that's a way to go when you die. With a, sad, uh, with a frown on your face. So Psalm 31, verse 10. Psalm 31, verse 10. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of what? Mine iniquity. See, so he wasted his whole life in sin when he's thinking about his life. Now, that's not what you want to think when you die. Now, I know this doesn't mean much to you, but when you're on that deathbed, it'll all come to you, and you're going to remember the words that this preacher told you. And it's going to bother you, and you're going to hate me after that. That's why I get right with God now. Amen. All right. Now, the list just goes on. What we're going to do now is split. So, these penalties are universal for everybody. Lost sinner and saved Christian. Now we got additional penalties we're going to add that are more specific for lost people and then more specific for saved Christians. So when I cover the lost people's penalty, then these are not going to be applied to you except those 11 that we covered, all right? When I cover the penalty of saved Christians here, you have to add that with the 11. What? Uh, we can't separate that from the 11? No, no, they have to be added with the 11. As much as I would like to separate it, you know, or get rid of the 11, <laughs> they have to be added with the 11. All right, then. Now we're going to look at the following things. Let's get the worst stuff out of the way, right? So why don't we do the types of penalty for the Christians, Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's get us out of the way. That way we don't have to feel that bad. 
Yeah, amen. Okay, in order to add this, we'll put Christians here. And then we'll put sinners here. And then we're going to add the numbers on how it goes. All right. A sinning Christian will be scourged by God. That's one, scourged. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 through 7. Hebrews 12, 6 through 7. Now, when you look at that verse, you're going to go, but isn't it chastisement where God loves me and all that? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's why I wrote down scourge, because it just sounds better when you, when you think of it that way. God loves me, he chastised me, so it's not that bad. You know what his chastisement is? It's scourging you. You know what scourging was like during that time period? Look up Cat Nine Tales on, on the web in your own individual uh, search, and then you'll see what scourging is. You don't want to be scourged by God. And trust me, it's a scourge, okay? You, I, I'm pretty sure most of us experience that. It is a scourge. You know what a scourging is? Not just one and you're done. That's what it is. All right. It keeps on going. All right, number two, sinning Christian will lose blessings. He will lose blessings from God. That's uh, James chapter 1, verse 12. James chapter 1. Let's turn over there. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Now, when you sing the song, Count Your Many Blessings, name them one by one, before you shout and rejoice, you might want to stop yourself and think, how many blessings have I lost? You know, some of you don't have a smile on your face when you're singing Count Your Many Blessings, and you don't have the joy of the Lord in you. Well, maybe you should stay that way. Maybe you do have a right to frown. You know why? You don't have many blessings, okay. that you cannot count them one by one. Preaching, James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed, see that? Mm -hmm. Is the man that what? Endure. Endure a temptation, not to the one who yields. So then you'll lose a blessing. Now go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 19. Verse 19. A sinning Christian will lose. You know what's worse than losing your blessings? Oh, no, you got to be kidding me. Seriously? That was pretty bad. Well, you'll lose your heavenly inheritance. That's worse. Your heavenly inheritance. Any blessing you can have in this life, let me tell you something. It pales in comparison to heaven. Hasn't God been good to you and blessed you with things that he didn't even give to other people? I've talked to, say, Bible believers that they got something that even lost people don't have, and they're jealous. And I'm talking about an earthly, physical position or blessing that they have that lost people do not have. That co-workers get jealous. Uh, students within the uh, classrooms, they get competitive, but you get that special privilege or that blessing in the school that the other students didn't have. I mean, I'm telling you, I have hear testimonies from these people. So God blesses his children, which is a wonderful thing that he's given to you in your life. But those things that lost worldly people covet what God blessed you with pale so much in comparison to heaven. And you're going to lose that if you sin. All right, now, when we look at Galatians 5, 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, what? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You lose your heavenly inheritance. 
All right, uh, look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Now, the worst one, the worst one for a saved believer, saved Christian, which most of you will know, is the unspeakable terror at the judgment seat of Christ. The unspeakable terror at the judgment seat of Christ. What makes it so terrible? Well, his grace is unspeakable, amen? It's so deep and profound that the half has not yet been told. But I wonder if that can be applied to the terror at the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, the half has never been told. I wonder how much that applies to the judgment. So whatever I tell you, ain't even the half of what you're going to get at the judgment seat. Why? Because of sin. Sin. That's how awful it is. Now God won't even tell you what the terrible thing is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All I know is that you have to believe it. And it will be terrible. When he says terror, it's terror. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, you're going to give an account for good or bad things you've done in your body at the judgment seat. Why? Knowing therefore, see, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. He doesn't tell you what the terror is. He doesn't speak to you what the terror is. He just says that it's a terrible thing. All right, now we're going to cover uh, lost sinners. If you're not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you do want to get saved because then you won't have any of these penalties applicable to you. The easiest is getting saved today. We can show, you can ask any one of us and we'll be happy to show you how to get saved immediately and all these penalties I'm going to show to you is automatically canceled. But if you're not saved in Jesus Christ, if you're not 100% sure that you'll go to heaven after you die and you turn out to be a lost individual, then these are the following penalties you will have. A lost sinner will have nothing work for good. Nothing work for good. Now that's a promise that all saved Christians have, even if they're backslidden, even if they sin. But lost people will have none of that. Anything that they do in their life is not for a better, uh, better thing later on. You notice how lost people always try to find in tragedy or when bad situations happen, that they try to find out some better purpose or, or silver lining, you know, within that. They, they always try to do that, but there is no such thing with them. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things, if you look at that verse, Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose those who are saved a lost sinner will live a life of defeat life of defeat you know why they always talk about we shall overcome they always talk they always have to encourage people do you know why they love positive preaching you know why they like that nice things to say from you do you know why they always like that so much because there is no good news with them it's always defeat, defeat, a life of defeat. So they want to be lost in a fantasy where they're always winning and good things are happening to them. That's right, man. That's good. That's good preaching, bro. So if you look at uh, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, but a saved Christian, you'll, you'll win at the end. Even if you're a sinning saved Christian, Hey, you're still going to win at the end. Jesus Christ is a winner at the end and will be the winners. 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. See, you win in life. If you feel like you're living a life full of defeat and you're a saved Christian, you shouldn't think that way. Victory is yours to claim. Amen. You just don't live like it. See, that's your only issue. But you are in it. You are in victory. You just need to live like it. 
Now, go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. A lost sinner will have no God to guide him to truth. A lost sinner will have no God to guide him to truth. He is left to his own natural devices. Well, I'm a truther, and I know everything, all the corruptions that's going on, and I'm all for truth. I'm into higher ed. I study so much that uh, I'm more into knowledge, knowing more. And No, uh, you, if you have no God to guide you to truth, all of that is just babble, babble, babble that you're getting into. Information of babble. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 14. A lost sinner will have no God to guide him. To truth, no truth, no guidance of truth. The next one, a lost sinner will have no assurance after death. Okay. Lost sinner will have no assurance after death. I don't know how you live life that way, if I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I don't know why people don't think about death. They try to pretend death is not there. Then when three years ago that incident happened, I never seen so, people, so many people panicking in all my life. Right. Now, I, now they're thinking about death. They have no assurance, but you and I, we're like, hey, who cares, you know? Better for us. We have assurance. We have assurance. We know where we go after we die. Now, they have to also face unspeakable terror. Uh, that's 1 John 5, 13. 1 John 5, 13. So that verse shows if you believe on Christ for salvation, then you will have the assurance. The, la uh, the fifth one that I want to cover is unspeakable terror. So they go through the same terrible feeling that we feel. The only difference, however, is the difference of the judgments and the difference of the sentencings. So the sentence, in our case, we still live in heaven. But they themselves, they still end up in hell. But that speaks volume. Isn't that similar with us, unspeakable terror? You may not burn in hell, but you got the judgment. And that ain't a cakewalk. See, that is the same thing that those lost people are feeling. Something for you to think about. But anyway, I, I know, uh, let's get, we're done with us, so let's not talk about us anymore, okay? Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. So that's unspeakable terror at the great white throne of judgment. So lost people face a separate judgment called great white throne of judgment. Save Christians, they go to the judgment seat of Christ instead. They also call that the Bema seat. Now, the last one is, which is the worst, and everyone can pretty much guess this. Where does the lost sinner go after he dies? What's the ultimate penalty? He burns in hell forever. And that's Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Now, uh, sir, ma'am, if you are listening to this teaching, if you are a saved believer... Sin ain't worth the price to pay. It's not a game. You can see right here, you know what? Let me just, uh, let me do this. Some of you might need this. Okay. So let's uh, count our many penalties and name them one by one, okay? <laughs> so you notice right here that if you're a saved believer, you, got, you, can't, you can only enjoy temporarily. That's the only good news I can ever give to you. You know, I don't covet lost people. I actually say this. Well, I hope that they, do, that they really are happy with their decision that they made, and they'll enjoy it the best that they can. I actually say that. You know why I say that? Because I know it's temporary, and that's the only good news they'll ever get. That's the only good news is enjoying temporarily, but that don't sound like good news anyway. You reap what you sow, you get no peace, you have to take care of yourself. In other words, you do have a right to be worried. So if you are worried and you're messing around with sin, I can't say calm down or help you out. I, 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 all I can say is 
Well, you're doing the right thing. Just keep on worrying. Your prayers are denied. You lose, uh, you lose joy, so you're never happy. You get frustrated with struggling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you can't get victory. Your conscience is never giving you a break. You always feel guilty or bad. Devil has a control or a hold of your life and oppresses you or possesses you. Your health is damaged and uh, you could possibly even die. And you end your life in tragedy. Nothing good about that. Added on top of that, you, you go through scourging by God. So God has to scourge. I don't know why he keeps doing that. You have to get scourged by God. And a scourging is not just once. It comes down a lot. It lands on you just like, bah, 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 like that. You lose blessings from God. You lose your heavenly inheritance. And worst of all, you face unspeakable terror that the, law, the same emotion that lost people feel at the judgment. If you're a lost sinner, you have to go through all of that, but you don't get these four things like saved Christians do. Instead, the replacement is these six factors. You get nothing working good for you. Nothing works for good. Everything is a life of defeat. No one guides you to truth. You have no assurance after you die, so you live in fear. You face unspeakable terror at the great white throne of judgment, and then you get cast into hell for all eternity. So that's the penalty of sin. So I would like to conclude today's study with uh, don't mess around with sin. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much uh, for the teaching of your book. It's in a very important doctrine from Hamar theology, the penalty of sin. I pray that uh, we will not forget them. We will take them seriously and live our lives more in peace and in joy and under your blessings because of forsaking sin. Help us to experience the joy of forsaking sin today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.